Hello, everyone watching and listening. Today, I'm speaking with former vice president and now 2024 presidential candidate Mike Pence. We discuss U.S. government overreach in economic matters when it should be playing referee, the indoctrination of our youngest citizens, how parents are being purposefully alienated from their children via ideological capture, the realistic way forward on the Russia-Ukraine front, the loss of international respect due to our current administration, and how we might finally stabilize a nation wrought with cultural warfare. It's very good to have you on this podcast, Mr. Vice President. It's, uh, it's quite the honor, as a matter of fact. Uh, I guess that's actually my first question. You know, this having presidential candidates sit down and do long-form podcasts like this, is, it's a new, it's new. Uh, like it's one year new, really. So what made you decide to take the risk, let's say, or take or grab the advantage or the opportunity to do a podcast with me? Well, Jordan, just thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I've, I've been an admirer of yours for a number of years. Um, uh, was uh, was turned on to your work by my by my kids, a few of whom you met <laughs> out on the road and on the trail. And so it's uh, it's a joy to be with you. Um, look, I, 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 the, the decision to run for the highest office in the land uh, is is one that no American would ever take lightly. And my family and I have given great thought, great prayer and deliberation uh, to this question uh, over the last two years. Uh, and frankly, ultimately, it comes down to two things. Number one, it's the privileges that we've had to serve, the experiences that we've uh, developed. Uh, I was not only vice president serving America at home and abroad, but I was also a governor of a successful state in Indiana where we cut taxes and expanded educational choice. And before that, for 12 years, I was a leader of of House conservatives uh, in uh, uh, the Congress of the United States. And uh, the, uh, the sum total of that 20 years of experience uh, gives us the confidence that if we were given the privilege of serving uh, as president of the United States, that, that we'd be prepared. We'd be prepared to bring this country back, which leads me to the second reason why we should decided to run. And that was, uh, uh, you know, I think this country's in a lot of trouble. I mean, as I've traveled around the country over the last two years, it's it's clear to me uh, that Joe Biden and the radical left uh, have weakened America at home and abroad, uh, and and we need new leadership. In the, I believe in the Republican Party and uh, in the White House that'll set this country back on a path uh, of a strong national defense, of limited government, of a commitment to freedom and to traditional values. And, uh, and it's in response to that. It's in the, it's in the belief on which, I, on which I was raised. I don't know if it made it in 12 rules, but it's an old rule in my life that to whom much is given, much will be required. And uh, my family and I have been given much. We've been given incredible privileges and opportunities to lead. And when we, when we look at the challenges facing our country today, we just felt we had a duty to step forward. Uh, we do so with great enthusiasm, and we've been very humbled at uh, the outpouring of support that we've received, MikePence2024.com, and what we've heard out on the road already since we announced a little earlier this week in the great state of Iowa. So we've met twice before. We met in Washington. I met you and your wife, and then we talked for about an hour and a half at one point, about, about a year ago, I believe. We did. And I walked away from that thinking, if uh, if Mike Pence was president, we might see a return to something like blessed normality. And that's a compliment, you know, be because I think the times when when politics <laughs> when politics gets radically interesting, something has gone dreadfully wrong. Like I'd rather see something approximating a sane and normative administration than a continual, exciting, like even hyper-charismatic battle. I think that's a sign of bad times. And so let me, let me, let me delve into that a little bit. You just outlined your qualifications. Well, I, uh, I'm very humbled by experience. those words. And, you know, it, it actually makes me think of uh, another time, maybe a century ago. And I'm not someone that looks backwards or wants to turn the clock back. We could stop that conversation uh, with anyone else now. But you know there was there was a season after World War One where uh, uh, 
a, a Republican ticket step forward, literally their message was a return to normalcy. <laughs> And I, I get a sense that the American people would like to get back to the policies that were advanced under a, a president I deeply admire, which was President Calvin Coolidge. Uh, he was someone that balanced budgets. He cut taxes. He oversaw an incredible time of American prosperity. But at the core of his philosophy was an often quoted Calvin Coolidge statement that the business of America is business. And, and by that, he, he meant the business of America is not the government itself, that, that the, the federal government should not or the White House should not be the center of American life. And they actually, uh, Calvin Coolidge restraint and his, his uh, instinctive conservatism uh, uh, really set a tone that allowed for a period of incredible innovation in the country. That's where we heard all the incredible stories about progress and in manufacturing and industry. And, uh, and, and I, I hold, I hold to the view that, uh, that it's the free market. It's free enterprise. That's where the energy comes from. I grew up in a small business family. I, I know who makes this country go every day. And the government should be playing the role of, of the referee of the private sector uh, and, and not at center court with all the attention focused there. So let me, let me touch on something else that you, you, you touched on earlier. You talked about the radical left. Now, I spent some time working with Democrats and I just interviewed Robert F. Kennedy and I asked him the same question that I've asked every Democrat I've met in the last five years. And the question I asked was, when does the left go too far? And I believe this to be true, that none of the Democrats that I've spoken with, and we spoke in good faith and we had serious conversations, were able to or willing to answer that question. Now, you made a comment about the radical left and so, when do you think the left goes too far, and and what would you what do you think if they are going too far? That those who are on the far left, like how do you identify that, and what do you think what do you think might be what's the appropriate response to that? Well, look, I've I've, I've been at this a while, um, and uh, but but I never thought I'd live to see the day that that uh, socialism was the animating economic philosophy of one of America's two major political parties. You know, I like to say to people, uh, uh, Joe Biden won the nomination of his party in 2020, but uh, but Bernie Sanders won the party. I mean, all the policies that you've seen flowing uh, out of the Democratic Party and out of the Biden administration are driven by European-style socialism and welfare state policies. And that's too far. I mean, as I said, this we we're we're a nation that was that was founded on the constitutional principles of a limited federal government, uh, a free enterprise, free market, private property. All of those things have been a wellspring, along with our faith, our family as a foundation of 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 creating the strongest and freest, most prosperous nation in the history of the world uh, by far. And so that to me is a go too far. But I will tell you this whole issue of uh, of 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 advancing through uh, critical race theory in our schools, literally teaching our kids uh, to, uh, uh, to to judge uh, judge their peers not by the content of their character, but by the color of their skin, the opposite of the vision of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then beyond that, the, the radical gender ideology that is afoot uh, in our schools, in our universities, and in the culture today, I think— uh, I, I think has uh, uh, literally shocked the conscience uh, of many parents uh, who who might never identify with uh, with uh, mainstream conservative philosophies that we share and traditional values that we share, Jordan. But they find themselves struck. I mean, I, I my foundation in Washington D.C. Uh, actually weighed in on a federal lawsuit, the Linmar Community Schools in Iowa require students to bring in a permission slip from their parents to get a Tylenol. Uh, but under the school policy, a student could get a gender transition plan from the health department at that high school without ever informing their parents. And as I said, uh, when we went to Iowa and spoke about it, that, that's not just bad policy, that's crazy. And I see parents, parents' rights groups are rising up all over the country uh, and and pushing back on uh, on the radical left's uh, effort to indoctrinate our kids, 
uh, uh, about our history uh, and 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 also this, this whole business of of uh, of trying to trying to communicate this radical gender ideology. I think it's I think it's there's a wellspring of support pushing back on that. I think you're going to see see that show up in 2024. Yeah, well, two things on that, I would say. The first, it was yesterday, you know, the National Health Service of the UK declared that they would no longer allow the use of puberty blockers except in re for children, except in research situations. And so I believe it's the UK, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Holland have all dropped, and Holland is where this started, by the way, the Netherlands. They're dropping the gender-affirming model of care and so the second thing is, um, yeah, this is a question I've been trying to put forward to Republicans, particularly at the level of the governor. So, you know, the faculties of education in the United States and in Canada have a hammerlock on teacher certification. And public education eats up about 50% of the state budgets. Now, I know this isn't a federal issue precisely, but I can't understand for the life of me why Republicans haven't noticed that by allowing the department or the, the faculties of education, which are among the most cor corrupt institutions in higher education, by allowing them to maintain their hammerlock on teacher certification, which they've done nothing to deserve, they're essentially handing over half the state budgets to the worst students at the universities who are the most ideologically addled, who have direct contact with children. So, I mean, from a strategic perspective, this seems to me to be a very bad idea. And, you know, it's it's hard to push back against a system of ideas like the like the woke congregation of ideas without also stepping into sensorial territory, you know, which is the threat, I suppose, to some degree with regard to what's happening in Florida. When you when you think about strategy to forestall the narcissistic progressive agenda, what sort of strategies do you have in mind that could be employed at the federal level? Well, first I I'm you know, I'm heartened to hear the progress in other countries protecting kids uh, from uh, from chemical or, or surgical gender transition. I, I strongly support efforts in my home state of Indiana and and around the country uh, to uh, prohibit uh, gender transition, chemical or surgical treatment for children under the age of 18. I, I'd look at uh, I'm. I, I'm libertarian enough to say, if, if you're an adult, live while you live. Uh, you know, uh, I may not agree with decisions you make, but we'll love you and and, and uh, uh, love our neighbor as ourselves, as my faith requires. Right, but live and let live. But for our kids, uh, absolutely not. We've got to take a strong stand. I did a town hall on CNN not long ago, and. The host of the show uh, insisted on asking me, I think about five times in a row, <laughs> about why I took such a strong stand on that. And I said, look, I I'm standing here not just as a former vice president and a governor. I I'm, I'm a dad. I'm a grandfather. This is really about protecting our kids from making decisions early in their lives but when they're not equipped to make them. There's a reason we don't let kids drive cars until they're 16, and uh, and you know you you can't even get a tattoo under the age of 18 in my home state. So <laughs> this principle of protecting kids from cho irreversible choices, uh, and and you know and have spoken more eloquently than maybe anyone else about the deleterious effects. Now go back to your question because I think it's the fundamental question, uh, and that is so how do we push back? And I will tell you. I believe that giving parents the ability to choose where their children go to school, public, private, parochial, or homeschool, is the cure for what ails education in America. I think your point about teacher certification is a profound one, but I'm very struck by the fact that uh, someone who I'm sure you respect a great deal, uh, in fact, a couple, uh, Milton and Rose Friedman, maybe one of the great uh, free market economic minds of the last century. Uh, he left his entire state to a foundation to promote one idea, and that was educational choice. Because Milton Friedman said, our form of government will not survive without an educated citizenry, and that the only power strong enough to, to transform and renew American education is the free market. 
It's a very simple idea. I'm proud to say the state of Indiana, Jordan, uh, was one of the pioneers in educational choice. We had uh, we were home to the very first privately funded school voucher program in the country that's been replicated all over the country for decades. But when I was governor, we had a we had a small educational choice program. I doubled it. I made it the largest in the country. But we just and I don't know if uh, if the viewers and listeners of your podcast know this, but we really turned a corner very recently in this debate when the state of Arizona, uh, under Governor Doug Ducey, in, in the last year in office, passed the first ever universal school choice program in the country. Uh, the state of Indiana has essentially followed about 98% of people of our state now have educational choice. Iowa has followed, other states are following. And I, I would submit to you that whether we're talking about the radical uh, left's agenda in our schools, whether it's critical race theory, woke politics, or some of the profound issues in higher education that you're speaking about, you give parents the ability to choose where their kids go to school, uh, to be able to take their business down the street and, and find a school uh, that, 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 you know, it gives them a more classical education uh, that, you know, uh, my, my school teacher wife would tell you that teaches phonics to kids. <laughs> They're not every, I mean, I mean, you, so parents will go shop and they will, I, I don't, I believe what, wherever people are uh, on that ladder of success in America, everybody loves their kids. Everybody loves their grandkids. And, uh, and you give them the power to choose where their kids go to school and uh, will turn education around in America faster than you could imagine. So I, I have a question, specific question about that. Um, when I was talking to one of my wiser friends about the issue of school choice, the objection he raised, and I wasn't really sure what to make of it, was that if you provide parents with choice, what you end up is a, with is a public school system that has the worst teachers and the students who are most disaffected and alienated from their parents. And so he felt that there was an element of that that would be disastrous for the kids who are in the worst shape with regards to parents and future opportunity. Has What's the experience of Indiana and the other states that have moved in the direction of school choice? What has that taught you or revealed in that regard? Well, I used to say, you know, I, I long before I held office for 20 years, I had a talk radio show. We used to talk a lot about this. And I... I grew up in a stand, in a family that ran gas stations. I, I actually worked for five years, helped pay my way through college, uh, pumping gas. And uh, so I would kind of break it down this way. I'd say to people, look, if there's only one gas station in town uh, and you had to buy your gas there, how clean do you think the men's room would be? Right? <laughs> I mean, so it's comp competition. <laughs> Competition for customers makes everybody better. And I will tell you, our experience in Indiana has been that our public schools have gotten better. They have, they have stepped into that competition and improved uh, once, once parents become empowered. We've seen, we've seen parents in Indiana over the decades choose another pi public school over the public school that's failing them. And I will tell you, it's, it's always been impressive to me that from very early on, uh, the African-American community in this country uh, has been uh, a, a, a generation ahead of the rest of the country in support uh, for educational choice. Jordan, and literally, literally back in the 1990s in Indiana, when the, when, the, when the overall population, even in a state that was promoting school choice, we'd maybe get 50, 55% of Hoosiers that would support allowing parents to choose where their kids go to school, the number in the African-American community in our state was closer to 70 to 75 percent. And and you and I know why. It's because of the minority communities in many of our major cities, their kids are relegated to some of the, the most failing and dangerous schools in the country. Those parents know. They say, give me the choice. They've taken that choice. And and it isn't and, and a lot of times they go to the they go to the to the school that's in their neighborhood, uh, they go to the little Catholic school that's just down around the corner, and it engages parents. I've heard the argument your friend made, and I look, I, uh, I, I don't mean to demean it, but it's just not been our experience. I mean, literally, I think of uh, you know John F. Kennedy back when he talked about cutting taxes 
across the board, including the capital gains tax. And he said, you know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, you create competition in education in America, as we have in Indiana, as states around the country are doing. Uh, all the schools get better. And uh, as someone who's married uh, to, to a woman that taught for 15 years in a public school, 15 years in a Christian school, I could tell you firsthand, there's a, there's a overwhelming majority that are teaching in our public schools or dedicated public servants, men and women that care deeply. It's just the management not being responsive, pushing down some sort of a liberal agenda, watering down uh, some of the fundamentals and, and uh, criteria for a good education. I think that washes away uh, in, in the, in the, through the force of the free market. I really do. So I feel obligated to warn you that according to the dictates of YouTube, apparently, we've both now engaged in hate speech and the incitement of violence. So I had a YouTube video taken off my channel yesterday, an interview with Helen Joyce, who wrote, who, who wrote a, a book on, on the trans minor surgery phenomenon. And so I'm sure we've broken the YouTube rules already in this discussion. So it'll be interesting to see what they do as a consequence of that. So, all right. So you think that, that you think that the experience in Indiana has shown that because of the introduction of competition, everybody benefits. And you said in particular, perhaps um, black students and their parents. Okay. So that's, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good for you in that direction. Let me ask you a couple of questions in a different direction, if you don't mind. Um, I think often at the moment that we're all fiddling while Rome burns because possibly because of the situation in Russia and Ukraine. And you know, and one of the things that I found heartening, let's say, about the Trump presidency where you served as vice president was that there were four years without a major war and your administration or that administration also advanced the Abraham Accords, which was a major move in the direction of peace in the Middle East. And now we have this war percolating away uh, madly between Russia and Ukraine, and it's really a proxy war in many ways for the West and Russia. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look very good to me. And so if you became president, first of all, what do you think the way forward is on that front? I know the hawks are saying, the hawks on the Republican side in particular, and I think this is also true on the Democrat side, are taking this as an opportunity to demolish Russia's conventional forces and to take them permanently out as a conventional enemy, let's say. Now, the problem I see in that is that when you push someone as powerful as Russia into a corner when they're nuclear armed and their conventional forces are weak, that that loosens the finger on the nuclear trigger. And it also doesn't seem to me that given how dependent we are on Russia and Ukraine for food and, and for energy, that weaken, weakening both of those countries on something approximating a permanent basis strikes me as as reasonable long-term policy. So what do you think the danger is on the Russia-Ukraine front and what would your administration, what steps would your administration take in that direction? Well, I'm someone that believes that America is the leader of the free world. We're the arsenal of democracy. In 1985, Ronald Reagan in a State of the Union address articulated what came to be known as the Reagan Doctrine, which essentially said, It'll be the policy of the United States that if you're willing to fight the communists in your country, we'll give you the means to fight them there so we don't have to fight them here. Uh, and it was part and parcel of, of what ultimately brought down uh, the Soviet Union. And, and I, I believe that that wisdom is still true today, uh, that uh, uh, Ukraine is uh, not our war, but freedom is our fight. Now, I, I know there are I know there are people in the presidential contest in my party uh, who have uh, uh, who, who have uh, spoke admiringly of uh, of Vladimir Putin's genius. Others have said that it's simply a territorial dispute. It's a, well, I can tell you, I know the difference between a genius and a war criminal. I, um, and uh, I know the difference between a territorial dispute and a Russian invasion. I mean, what, what's happening in Ukraine today is an unprovoked invasion that is claiming hundreds of thousands of lives. And I believe it's incumbent on the United States of America to continue to lead the West uh, and provide the Ukrainian military what they need to repel the Russian invasion and reclaim their sovereignty. Now, I, 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 I believe that's the right thing to do. My wife and I, Jordan, about a year ago, were visiting a Christian relief group in Poland 
uh, that was assisting refugees. And when we arrived, we were told that we were cleared to go into Ukraine. Uh, this was a month after hostilities had begun. And we went 10 miles across the border to a refugee center. And Jordan, I, I say this with a broken heart. I, I saw things uh, I thought I'd never see other than in black and white films uh, from 75 years ago. I mean, there were all crowds of all women of every age, children of every age, carrying everything they could carry on their backs, literally fleeing uh, this this uh, this uh, unconscionable Russian invasion. And so I, I, I think we have an obligation to be there. But I, I also want to say to you, I think it's in our national interest. There's others who have said that it's not. I, I've met Vladimir Putin. Um, I, I believe it was no coincidence that uh, ours was the only administration uh, in the 21st century where Putin did not attempt to redraw international lines by force. I mean, he rolled the tanks into the country of Georgia under the Bush administration. He, of course, took Crimea under the Obama administration, and now he's rolled across the border of Ukraine. I think the reason he did, didn't do that during our years was because we had the largest uh, increase in military spending uh, in more than a generation. Uh, we unleashed our military against ISIS, and they took them down without firing a shot. We actually took down 100 uh, Russian mercenaries in a conflict in Syria without one American casualty. We shut down the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, for all of, uh, of the uh, rhetorical efforts by my old running mate to a reopened dialogue with Russia. We were very tough on Russia, and we were willing to use American military force to defend our interests and defend our allies around the world. And I think that kept Russia in check. Uh, so uh, I think this is a moment that needs to be met with American strength, uh, and I'm going to continue to advocate for that. I also think at the end of the day, if if Russia was able to overrun Ukraine, it, in my judgment, it would not be long before the Russian military uh, was crossing a border where we would have to send uh, troops like like my son, the Marine, my son-in-law, uh, the Navy pilot. Uh, he crosses into a NATO ally, then we're involved. We we should not ever send American troops into Ukraine. We should we should hasten the delivery of military equipment uh, and give them the ability to defend themselves. But I think stopping Russia there is also in the interest of the United States. And it sends, a, it sends a deafening message to China. Lastly, Jordan, it sends a deafening message to China. If we repel, we give Ukraine the ability to repel the Russian invasion, then I, I have no doubt in my mind that President Xi, who I've also met and spoken to privately, uh, I, I, think, I think he will uh, he'll get more instruction from that uh, regarding uh, his potential military ambitions in the Asia Pacific than than anything else that we could do. I was just informed your team wants thirty seconds to speak with you. Oh, I don't, my team doesn't need me. Oh, hi. Oh, it's just my wife said hi. Come oh, on. <laughs> come over. Well, well here, that's Karen, that's a good step, step over. That's here. a good emergency. Yeah. Just stick your head. He could see if you look at the screen. Karen Jordan. Pence, Jordan Peterson. Hello. <laughs> nice Hello, to see nice you. Hello, nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you. Hi. Good. Thank you for lending us your husband for an hour. <laughs> but anyway, hello. <laughs> I told him the kids are big fans. That's how we got uh, Yeah. So le let me ask you then more specifically, if the war in Russia plays out the way that would be most beneficial to the West, what what's your vision for victory and the cessation of conflict? What is it do you suppose that Russia has to leave on the table or bring to the table in order to bring this war to a halt? Yeah, I just think I think we have to support the Ukraine military till they repel this Russian invasion uh, from across their borders. I don't. I don't now, I, I'll I'll defer to uh, President Zelensky and. Uh, the government in Ukraine, if they have a different view, but I think, I, I think that giving them the means to push Russia out uh, from uh, where it commenced this invasion uh, is absolutely essential to sending to sending a message uh, to the wider world uh, that uh, that America is the leader of the free world, and we'll support those that are standing for their freedom and sovereignty. And, and do you think that would mean that the Russians would have to abandon the territory they took on on the east 
And also, what about the situation in Crimea? What do you see the post-war? I don't understand exactly what might constitute the post-war boundaries of Ukraine. Yeah, well, if we, I think if if things worked out as well as they could. Well, I, I, again, I would leave that question, uh, which predated our administration, uh, to to the Ukrainian government. Um, uh, but with regard to this this invasion, this incursion, the Donbas region, I I just don't think we can tolerate it. And let me also say, um, President Biden said in his State of the Union address that we're there as long as it takes. Uh, Jordan, it shouldn't take that long. <laughs> we're the arsenal of democracy. We've been dragging our feet on giving them equipment. Uh, we promised them 33 Abrams tanks uh, all the way back in January. They still don't have them. We've been dragging our feet on on giving them aircraft. Uh, you know, it was our administration that 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 started back providing uh, military uh, resources to Ukraine. The Obama Biden administration had refused to provide any military resources. They were they were sending uh, blankets and MREs. We came in. We we provided them javelin missiles. We provided them resources that they were able to use in this fight uh, over the four years of our administration and. Uh, uh, the Biden administration immediately ended that when they came in, but at the initiation of hostilities started to catch up. But I want, I want to be clear to all of your viewers and, and listeners, Joe Biden has been slow on the uptake. And I think that, frankly, the disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan created the conditions that emboldened the enemies of freedom. Uh, now, Vladimir Putin is the one that's responsible for this unconscionable invasion, but I have no doubt in my mind that that disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan uh, emboldened him to move, and uh, and and I, I, I honestly believe that it's been the failed policies of the Biden administration uh, that are contributing to not only war in Eastern Europe, Chinese provocations, but but for heaven's sakes, Jordan, after we achieved uh, the first peace accord in nearly 30 years in the Middle East. Uh, the Biden administration did nothing to build on the Abraham Accords, sent, has sent ambiguous signals to Israel about our support, and then, stood, and then stood idly by while China negotiated a treaty between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, there is a vacuum of American leadership uh, on, on the world stage today, and, and uh, the antidote here is American engagement, American leadership, and American strength. It also, it's also worth folks that are looking on knowing the Biden administration has been busy cutting military spending since day one. And uh, <clears throat> the only thing positive about that, that gigantic supplemental bill that passed at the end of the last Congress was that it caught up on military budget cuts that the Biden administration had been advancing. But with this new debt ceiling deal, people deserve to know that uh, after you net out inflation, it's got a 1% cut in military spending. China's floating a new battleship every month and has doubled its military budget in the last 15 years. And here we have an administration that is cutting military spending, uh, all the while they're, they're carrying that political correctness and, uh, and critical race theory and a radical gender ideology into into the Pentagon's hallways itself. So we we need new leadership. We need to be building a military that's fitted to the times. That's also the best way to ensure peace in the world. Always has been, always will. So your sense is that the best strategy for dealing with Russia, and also, sim tell me if I've got this right, and also simultaneously Ch China, is to bolster the American military to ensure that Russia, uh, that the sufficient aid is provided to Ukraine to stop Russia in its tracks, that that sends the proper message to China, um, that that would require further support for the American military, and that that's the best way to stop Russian adventurism. What do you think of arguments that Russia had felt threatened as a consequence of NATO incursion into Ukraine, and that a fair part of this conflict emerged because the Russians felt that they were being encroached upon by, by the expansion of the NATO alliance and, and the potential inclusion of, of Ukraine into that domain. I mean, and, you know, it's also the case that Putin certainly has 
appealed to his people on that front. He's also told his people that he is a buttress against the kind of woke ideology that we've also discussed. And so, um, well, those are all. And then the third problem, I suppose, is that I'm still concerned, understanding your argument, I'm still concerned that pushing the Russians into a corner where they become dangerously weak heightens the probability of, let's say, limited exchange of nuclear weapons on the battlefield. So you said we, we frighten China, we keep Russia at bay. I'm concerned about the fact that the Russians perhaps share some of the more conservative Western views with regard to the woke nightmare, and also that if we push them into a corner, they're more likely to have an itchy nuclear trigger finger. So... Well, I, I just honestly believe the NATO argument, the threat from NATO, that, that's, that's all just posturing by Putin. He's, you carefully examine his public statements for years, Jordan. He's been very clear uh, that his ambition is to reestablish what was the old Soviet sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so there's, I mean, look, the, uh, NATO has been a, a peaceful alliance of the West, uh, forged as it was in the aftermath uh, of World War II. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I, uh, uh, I think there's one reason and there's one person to blame for the unconscionable invasion and war that's raging in Ukraine today, and that's Vladimir Putin. And we just simply need to hold him to account. With, with regard to the fact that we never want to forget uh, that Russia is uh, uh, the second largest nuclear power uh, in the world, uh, I, I believe we we need to make it clear that our military support uh, for Ukraine is for uh, uh, repelling the Russian invasion in Ukraine uh, and restoring uh, their sovereignty. I think that it's absolutely essential that the Commander in Chief of the United States make it clear uh, to the Ukrainian military uh, and our alliance how far uh, our <laughs> support goes. Uh, and and I think that that uh, that making it clear that this is about reestablishing uh, what's been claimed and not uh, not uh, intruding upon or uh, attempting to uh, uh, you know move into the sovereign territory uh, of Russia is important. And uh, look, it's uh, uh, but uh, this is this is statecraft. This is real, and I I just have to hold view that that. Uh, Weakness arouses evil, but peace comes through strength. And I think that we, by electing a new president that understands that basic principle, that's able to marshal the support in the Congress, to build a military fitted to the times, by by hastening the support, if the war isn't already over, hastening the support of the Ukrainian military to repel the Russian invasion. I think the world quiets down very quickly. And again, I, I... the the argument that I really reject is people that say, well, no, the, the real issue in the world today is China. Well, uh, okay, I, I've met President Xi. I've I've been to China. I, I'm I'm a student of of China's ambitions. I've met with all of our allies in the region. I understand uh, what China's up to, um, uh, and and how broad their ambitions are. But I also believe that. Uh, as you can see, the alliance has been forged between Xi and Putin. That 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 Xi is looking very carefully at how the West responds uh, to Russia's attempt to redraw international lines by force. And while while it's continued its provocations, even over the last two weeks, with uh, with with uh, navy ships at sea uh, in the Taiwan Straits and in the air. Uh, uh, sending a message to them that uh, the free world will not tolerate redrawing international lines uh, by military force will will contribute greatly to to um, um, uh, tamping down uh, China's ambitions in the Asia Pacific. Do you two questions then? Do you think that Putin respects Biden as a negotiating partner, and do you think that? Putin would respect you as a negotiating partner and maybe why to both of those questions? Well, I, it, it would be hard for me to believe that Putin or any leader around the world, um, I, I think they respect the United States of America 
but I I don't know that they uh, that they respect the president of the United States today at the at the level that they should. I, and and it just comes from a series of steps by this administration. Um, well, I mean, to unilaterally reopen Nord Stream two to Russia. I mean, it was a it was a policy of of appeasement on to reverse one of the policies we'd we'd put into effect made no sense at all to to uh, to attempt to get back into the Iran nuclear deal, literally hat in hand, begging uh, the the, uh, the the uh, the mullahs in in Iran to come back to the table uh, and renegotiate. Uh, until it 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 finally fell apart was was just a, absurd, uh, and and uh, and of course the fact that we had negotiated an agreement in Afghanistan with the Taliban that made it clear that they were required to uh, work with the Afghan national government, never harm any military personnel, and never harbor terrorists. Those were the three preconditions, or we we made it clear to them that we would hit them harder than they'd ever been hit before. Eighteen months went by in our administration and the early days of this one where there was not a single American casualty in Afghanistan. The Taliban knew, knew we meant business. But in this administration, when we began an orderly withdrawal, which for some incomprehensible reason uh, got got delayed— uh, into well after the fighting season. And if you recall, President Biden, uh, it was leaked that they were talking about making the departure on September 11th, uh, which was it, it, incomprehensible to me that we would mark that date, a, a date of, of uh, a, a dark day in American history, the source of which was launched from Afghanistan for the withdrawal. In any event, that, that he moved the date of withdrawal, he delayed it, he gave the Taliban the opportunity to reconstitute. But the initial failing was when the, when, the, when the Taliban began to move their military in the north into Mazar al-Sharif, and we did nothing. Uh, I, I think that set into motion not only the disaster that claimed the lives of 13 American servicemen, and women, courageous servicemen and women who were standing at, at the airport in Kabul trying to save lives. Uh, but I, I actually I actually think it it, it set the conditions for uh, the, the Afghan National Army to throw their guns down, make no opposition at all. Uh, and since then we've also confirmed and and at least in one instant taken successful action against them harboring terrorists once again in Afghanistan. But all of those conditions, I believe, may well, I don't know, may well have contributed to Putin uh, assuming that if he rolled into Ukraine, that the same thing would happen. I mean, you remember Joe Biden actually actually was asked, would would we get involved if there was a Russian invasion? And he actually made reference, well, if it was a small invasion, it would depend. I, and and then when when the invasion began, if you remember, the administration leaked to the media that they'd reached out to President Zelensky, who I know and became familiar with, they reached out and said, "We'll send a plane, like like uh, like Ghani, who got on a plane and got out of Afghanistan uh, as soon as things began to collapse." And and in words that I think will echo into history, President Zelensky said, "We don't need a plane; we need ammunition." Uh, and and uh, and and he squared his shoulders and and uh, and fought back against the Russian invasion. So all of this, when you say to me. Uh, Look, I'm an American. I'm a patriotic American. I love our country. The world respects the United States of America, but do they respect our current commander in chief at the level that they should? I, I, I would argue they do not. Okay, so so the second part of that question is, you know, do you think Putin would respect you? And but I want to modify that question slightly too, because there must be a temptation at this level of intense negotiation. I suppose a psychological temptation, also to not be strong, but to look strong, right? And, and you can imagine that a weak man in a position of power will fall prey to the temptation to look strong and to therefore put forward more force that is, than is absolutely necessary in an attempt to buttress his image. And so I would like to know how 
how it's best for leaders to protect themselves against that temptation. So you're, if you became president, you would step into the hot seat huh, in, in, that's, that's being heated up in many ways simultaneously. How do you protect yourself psychologically against the temptation to, you know, to, to beat your chest and be a strong man in, instead of trying to settle the situation internationally in the manner that's best for everyone going forward. And, and this, this pertains to the question of why Putin might regard you as a respectable negotiating partner. So let me, let me let you elaborate on that. I mentioned Calvin Coolidge at the outset of our conversation. I, in my announcement speech last week, I quoted Calvin Coolidge, who said, it's altogether a benefit to the country. Uh, uh, and to the office holder where the president does not consider himself to be a great man. <laughs> and and I, I, I can assure you, uh, uh, I, I'm never confused about that. I'm an everyday American. Um, I'm a small town guy from Southern Indiana, raised by a combat veteran, um, family that lived the American dream. But I, look, I, I, uh, you, you ask a, a very profound question and I, I go back again to history. I, that's what all of my, my background was in college, I, I was a student of American history. Teddy Roosevelt, I think, said it well, that on, on the global stage, America should walk softly and carry a big stick. Um, that uh, that I, I, you know, I've, I've had, uh, I, I'd leave it to others to, to judge how my leadership would be assessed, but I, I, I think I've got a reputation for standing my ground. I think, I think people know that my yes is yes and my no is no. Uh, the way that I would maintain that, I would, I would tell you, is for me as a Christian believer, is a daily time in devotions and prayer. Uh, I'm someone that really uh, believes in, uh, in, in investing time in my faith to study and understand uh, what the Bible teaches about wisdom, and uh, I've always sought to apply that in my life. But with regard to Vladimir Putin, I can tell you I've had a conversation with him one-on-one. -on -one. And it was at a international conference, and uh, we had a brief exchange, and he wanted a private moment together. This was in the, the year leading up to the midterm elections in 2018, Jordan. Uh, we had a pull aside. There were a fair number of people around, and this has been written about, and I wrote about it in my book. Uh, but as he began to engage me, he had an international conference coming up with President Trump, and he asked... Uh, you know, if I would convey a desire for nuclear non-proliferation, that we've got to begin to talk about those things. I nodded and listened, and then I looked at him and I said, standing just a couple of feet away from him, I looked at him and said, uh, well, Mr. President, I have something I'd like to say to you. And he said through Russian, through an interpreter, he said, I, go ahead. And I said, we know what happened in 2016 and it can't happen again. And with that, he sure, he speaks perfect English. With that, he feigned that he didn't understand uh, my statement, and, uh, uh, and, he, and he turned to his foreign minister, Lavrov, who was standing nearby, and Lavrov said in English, elections. I mean, look, in the 2016 election, uh, the Russians did not interfere on behalf of any particular candidate. They interfered across the board. It's what they do in Western countries. They, they sow dissension and misinformation, and, and we know for a fact it happened, and I'd said so publicly. But so he turned back to me after Lavrov said uh, elections um, and said uh, through Russian, he said, no, that wasn't us. We, we had nothing to do with that. That wasn't us. And I, I nodded and said, uh, Mr. President, I'm very aware of what your public position is on this, but I'm telling you, we know what happened in 2016, and it can't happen again. At that point, he uh, he shrugged, did a half nod, and uh, the conversation moved on. I mean, that's really really where it begins, I think, between heads of state. And I've been able to represent the United States on the world stage. Um, that wasn't a very private conversation. There were a lot of staff on both sides. There's pictures of it you can find on the Internet pretty easily. And there were reporters within earshot that wrote about that moment. But I think the, the most important thing between heads of state is that uh, you have the ability to look people in the eye and, um, uh, and, and tell them what your expectation is and make it clear where the consequences will be, uh, even without saying it. 
And uh, I, I would tell you that if I had the great privilege of being president of the United States, I'd I'd look for friends all over the world for the United States. I'd look for opportunities for peace. But, uh, um, you know, I'd, I'd always, uh, I'd have one hand extended in friendship and the other hand resting comfortably on the holster of the arsenal of democracy uh, so that uh, those who are enemies of freedom around the world who would threaten our people or threaten our allies um, I would know uh, America means business. So we have time. I know you have a hard out in an hour. Um, we have time for one more question. And so I'm going to ask you a follow-up to something you just described. I mean, when I met you and your wife and, and when we talked, I did get the impression, you know, that I, I walked away from that conversation thinking that, that for, for what it's worth, that, that you struck me as a man who could be trusted. And I already made reference to the fact that I think you could bring a certain degree of admirable normalcy to the insanity that reigns at the moment. But I would say in reference to the great man issue, you served for a long while as the right-hand man of a man who I think does style himself, rightly or wrongly, a great man. And, and of course, the shadow of Trump or the legacy of Trump hangs over you, rightly or wrongly. Why is it that you served with Trump for so long? Why did you think that was in your best interest, his and the country's? And why do you now think that you would make a better leader than your than the former president? Well, first, let me say I'm humbled by your kind words. Uh, uh, my respect for you is boundless, and um, I'm grateful for those words. I'll share them with my wife when we break. Um, well, first, look, uh, when when I got the phone call to join the national ticket or the, a group of people being considered for it, um, uh, I didn't expect it. I'd actually endorsed another candidate in the primary in Indiana, <laughs> but uh, but Donald Trump had won the nomination. And uh, for me, uh, uh, the prospect of Hillary Clinton serving as president uh, for eight years following uh, uh, the liberal and failed governance of, of uh, Barack Obama for eight years was an incredible threat. Uh, to the America that I had grown up in, I, I, I thought if we if we put 16 years of essentially a socialist agenda uh, in effect uh, driving America toward a secular European style welfare state, uh, my my children and grandchildren would not grow up in the America that I had grown up in. And so, for me, when the phone call came, uh, I had one of two questions I, that I said I would I would need to have answered. Number one, we'd need to know them better. We didn't know. Uh, either the president or his family at all, and everything the Pences do, we do as a family. And secondly, I said I'd want to know what the job description was, because uh, only one person gets to write that job description every four years for the vice president. And so, um, I mean, my, my attitude was uh, if, if, we, if we felt there was a rapport that we could establish with them as a family, which we did almost immediately with them, um, but if I, I felt like a job description would give me the ability to help the country, uh, first by defeating Hillary Clinton, and secondly by advancing a conservative agenda, um, uh, I, I, I was anxious to do that. And once he, once he explained to me that the role of the vice president in his mind would be an active role, it'd be active in the legislative process, active in even interviewing appointments to the Supreme Court, active around the country, promoting our policies active around the world, representing America. When the phone call came, Jordan, I said yes in a heartbeat. And I will tell you, I'm incredibly proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration. I mean, uh, I mean, my old running mate promised to govern as a conservative, and we did. We, we cut taxes, rolled back regulation, three justices to the Supreme Court that just gave America a new beginning uh, for life. We rebuilt our military, created the first new branch of our armed forces. We secured the southern border of the United States of America. And as you've said many times in this conversation, uh, the world was much more peaceful. And, uh, and, and, uh, and ISIS was destroyed. And uh, the most dangerous terrorist in the world was taken out. It's all a record I'm incredibly proud of. Um, in fact, as I'll share again here in North Carolina today, I, some people might wonder why I'm running against my former running mate. Um, in the wake of how proud I am of that record. Some in this field are already criticizing our record. It's their right to do that. Uh, but I'll, I'll battle them on that too. 
But for me, it came down to the promise that I made when I took my oath of office and the overall direction of the party. As I said in my announcement speech, uh, when I raised my right hand, I swore to the American people and to Almighty God that I would support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And on that fateful day, January 6, uh, President Trump uh, uh, asked me to choose him over the Constitution. But I thought my duty was clear and still believe it was, that I was I was there under the Constitution to preside over a joint session of Congress, to open and count the votes that had been certified by the states, reviewed by the courts, and would be debated in objections in the Congress. But our job was to open and count, no more, no less. We did our duty that day, I'll always believe, by God's grace, um, to ensure the peaceful transfer of power. But the fact that the president continues uh, to say that I had the right to overturn uh, the election uh, uh, animates me. I, I think I think no one should ever serve as president of the United States who puts themselves over the Constitution of the United States. It's the oath we swear, and I'm going to take that case to the American people. But secondly, it has to do, my candidacy is animated by my belief in the conservative agenda, something that you've articulated in new and renewed and fresh ways for individuals and for the country, and I'll always be grateful for that. But it, it's, a, it's an agenda about American leadership in the world. I mean, it's my old running mate and others are backing away from America's leadership. I, I, I want to lean in. I want to. I want to rebuild our military. I want to make sure that that we continue to be the leader of the free world. When it comes to uh, uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, Joe Biden's policy is insolvency. I mean, we have a national debt the size of our nation's economy, and Joe Biden won't even talk about uh, the entitlements that represent seventy percent of the federal budget and growing. We are headed to a debt crisis the likes of which the world has never seen. And Joe Biden refuses to talk about it, but my old running mate refuses to talk about it. I mean, Joe Biden and Donald Trump have the exact same policy on entitlement reform. And many Republicans as well in this field also shy away from talking about it. I'm going to talk about uh, how we deal with the national debt, how we improve and reform these programs. And lastly, my commitment to the sanctity of life. Uh, I'll always be grateful to have been part of an administration that appointed three of the justices that sent Roe versus Wade to the ash heap of history where it belongs. Uh, but now in this new season, this new era for life, just at this moment when we can work to expand protections for the unborn, protections for women in crisis pregnancies, support for newborn, some in our party, including my old running mate, are shying away uh, from standing firm out of uh, concern for its impact on politics. Um, I, I don't believe that. I, I believe if we stand firm with compassion and principle, the American people will rally to our cause. But uh, but even if they did not, I think the cause of life is the calling of our time, the sanctity of life being restored to the center of American law, I think must remain uh, an objective of the Republican Party. And uh, so for all of those issues, uh, it's what brings me to this fight. But uh, that was why I joined the ticket to begin with. And no regrets, no regrets. I'm grateful for what we did, were able to do for the country. Uh, I, was, I was sorry it came to the end that it came to, but uh, I'm absolutely convinced if we'll keep our party and our country on course of the same policies that minted our movement, starting back in the days of Ronald Reagan and going forward, uh, that uh, we'll restore this country, we'll... Uh, We'll secure our nation. America will be stronger and more prosperous than ever before. So help us God. All right, sir. I am I swore to your staff that I would <laughs> ensure that this podcast lasted no longer than its deemed time, and that was a really good place to end, I would say. And so thank you very much for taking the time to talk with everyone who's watching and listening today and with me. It's a, a privilege to be involved in the election campaign in the manner that I am, and I certainly appreciate your time and attention, as I do appreciate the time and attention of everyone who's watching and listening. And so, perhaps, sir, sometime in the future, you've got a whole year on the campaign trail, we can sit down and have a further discussion. There were lots of other Pandora's boxes that we could have opened, but we covered a fair bit of territory usefully today, and so... Once again, I'd like to express my appreciation for your willingness to sit and talk with me. I'll look forward to it, Jordan Peterson, and God bless you for your matchless voice. Ciao, everyone.
Bye-bye, sir.